Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to another Grip Berkman Coaches Cafe. We're going to continue our conversation today talking about core beliefs. We have a long list of core beliefs that we hold dear that guide us as our guiding principles for what we are doing as Grip Berkman. And we're going to try and have a good stimulating dialogue for you today. I uh, want to remind you that we do meet every first Wednesday at 9 a.m. Central Time, whether that's Central Daylight or Central Standard Time, USA. And hope you'll be able to join us live if you're watching this recorded session. Uh, to get us started, let me just uh, have a quick word of prayer, if I might. Lord, I want to thank you for this opportunity that we have today to be talking about the privilege that we have of being your representatives, working with people in your kingdom to help them learn how they can celebrate their differences and their uniqueness, to draw them into closer unity as the body of Christ that will then help them, Father, to be even more effective in the task of leading more people to saving faith in Jesus Christ. So I hope, I, I pray, Father, today that you will help us to keep our conversation focused on that purpose, that we are trying to build unity so that more people will know Jesus. And then, Father, that this will be beneficial to many, many people, not just the coaches that might be seeing this uh, recorded session, but those many people that will be touched because of those ministries, Father. And then there'll be fruit that will come to you that will grow and will become much fruit. And you will be glorified as our Father in heaven. And we'll give you all the praise and the glory and honor because of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, guys, I want to pick up right off the bat where we left off last month. We got through about four of our core beliefs, and I'd like to get through four specifically today. In fact, I'm going to plan that we're going to get through these four, and um, however long it takes us to get through those four, if we get through before the top of the hour, then we'll just call it a day at that, if that sounds good to everybody. Uh, actually, even if it doesn't sound good to everybody, that's what I'm planning for us to talk about today. And then if you've got other things you want to bring up, then we'll have some time to to talk about those other issues as well. So let me just kind of jump right in here to the um, next slide. If I can be sure and get to my share. There we go. All right, right off the bat, I've got a technical difficulty where it's not, ah, there we go. Okay, talking about our core beliefs. <clears throat> Start here in June, so there we are. Each person is a unique, individual created with natural innate interests and underlying needs or expectations that affect how we interact with others around us. That's a pretty long statement. We're going to kind of break it down. It's based on Psalm 139, 13 to 14, which is really at the core of, uh, of everything. This is a central core belief, super important one for us. From Psalm 139, you created my inmost being. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And of course, we love the NIV translation of that that says fearfully and wonderfully because we often talk about how some of us are more wonderfully made and some of us are more fearfully made. But the truth of the matter is the focus of it is that we are each a unique individual. And that's one of the things that Grit Berkman celebrates is our uniqueness and not just slotting us together and grouping us with a bunch of other people that are just like us, we get to really be unique. So the, the question I really want to start off with is, um, since we illustrate this core belief by the Berkman map, that's where we introduce this core belief. We present the map, we have the symbols there, each individual starts to see where they are located uh, uniquely on the map, and the, the question for you is, how do you use the Berkman map to get people talking about their individual uniqueness? And uh, you can open up your mics and just join in with any of your comments about that. How do you use the map effectively to get people talking about their uniqueness? Uh, well, Larry, one of the things that comes to my mind uh, related to that is uh, people uh, have a chance to look at uh, the difference between the, like their interests and their strengths. And just having those two uh, uh, 
sets of information to look at really gives them a, a conversation, you know, to, to bring out. So it's a comparison contrast between their interests, which a lot of people don't see, compared to their behavior or their strengths that, that a lot of people see. And uh, there's a, there are a lot of conversations that can happen just around those two symbols on the map. I had one yesterday. That's why uh, I'm thinking about it. Yeah, that's a good point, Neil. And how do you get an individual, if you're just coaching an individual and not with a team, how do you get that individual to start talking more about that? Well, uh, this particular guy is in a, a career transition, and he was talking about how uh, his, uh, his previous job was, uh, was not a very good fit for him because uh, he reflected on how his uh, role uh, didn't, didn't line up with his interests. And uh, maybe half of the interests or some of the interests lined up with, with his previous career, but uh, he's a go-getter. Uh, he's a software developer. He's, he has side projects that are uh, very dynamic and interesting. And he's not even sure he wants to go back into like a corporate job. And if he can design anything that he wants, he wants it to be more in line with his interests. So it was a, it was a very interesting conversation to look at um, uh, the fact that his interests are by um, are very high in, in outdoors, but almost all of his work was uh, sitting in front of a screen. Mm. So we had a, a really good conversation just around those two themes. So here was a guy who recognized that his job was sapping him of energy because it was not allow him, allowing him to really focus on his interests. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in, in the future, he's going to be able to, uh, especially if he's uh, uh, self-employed and essentially developing his own co company, he's going to be able to design a lot more of that, uh, that job around his interests. Mm. Very good. Yeah. You know, most assessments identify usual style and maybe even stress styles of behavior in some cases, but the Bertman method offers insight into why you move into stress, your motivations, which no other assessment does. And many times we've discovered that it's because some of those top interests that really are so high that they have become needs, those interests are not being addressed. And so how do you get people to talk more about that and to um, really get into conversation about that and how they are going about getting those needs met with some of those interests that might not have been addressed for a very long time? Larry, one of the things that we did talk about was how his, even in his previous job, how he was uniquely having uh, some of his needs met and, and uh, stoking his interest through his uh, current job. Even though he was in front of a computer screen a lot, he, uh, he was able to identify some ways that uh, he could uh, engage in his outside interests. And he ha I don't think he'd thought about that before. Hmm. So like through hobbies, sports, um, well, other activities? Yeah. Right, but uh, a lot of the like software solutions he was developing were uh, uh, for use out on the field. Oh, and so uh, he was able to put himself in the place of a let's say a field worker. Uh, in, in this case, it was uh, a power plant, mm -hmm. um, uh, and so he put himself in that outside uh, experience as as he was developing the software, and then of course he'd be on site. Uh, different times during the, um, you know, the course of his year. So it, it, it also stimulated the question of, uh, if this is such a high interest, where are those needs currently being met, even though your job description doesn't have that as part of it? Yeah. So there's right. a whole number of coaching questions you can ask around the theme of, of that. And, uh, uh, it's, it's the idea of being unusually curious about uh, what those symbols might mean and, uh, and how you're currently uh, meeting those needs and how it relates to your strengths and how you're using those. 
Yeah. So back, Larry, back to your original question. Yeah, Wayne. I, I'll typically take them through, you know, just out of their report, you know, say, you know, just to do a brief explanation, especially with the new signature reports of just about how it works, about, you know, position, about movement, you know, about the introvert, extrovert, you know, direct, indirect. Um, I still use that language, direct and indirect, because, well, it's even in the reports at some places. Mm -hmm. But I think sometimes that's more helpful in explaining, you know, how I interact with someone. Um, you know, I don't interact so much as an introvert. I interact more directly. Um, but um, so I'll typically walk them through that. And then I've created a wall poster. Um, and I just did this with a pastoral staff of four. I've created a wall poster with the, um, with the um, um, map, Berkman map on it. And I'll have everybody go, go do their, you know, take their map and put it up on the wall. And then I'll just simply say, so what do you all see? What are you, what are you seeing? And uh, just give them a few minutes to kind of look at each other's stuff. And, um, you know, I ask the question, so what do, you, what do you see? How are you, how are you different? How is everybody different? How does, how does this begin to flesh out? What is this, how does this inform you all um, as far as how you work together or how you don't work together? Um, and, um, and so we just kind of let them start just making observations um, about themselves and about each other. Um, um, through, uh, through just ob ob observing the, the larger map on the wall. Um, and then with this particular group, it was very interesting. Their circle and squares were all down in the bottom right-hand quadrant of the mm. blue. Mm. Yeah. And um, all, all four pastors. And, um, you know, I, I asked some questions about that. Just, you know, so tell me about how you guys, how you guys work. Do you do you spend time working together, and or or do you just kind of like get together for a brief time each week? Because I knew they have a staff meeting, mm -hmm. and, then, and and it turns out they get together for about an hour and a half, two hours on Monday morning, and then they basically all go their individual ways, right? Which mm -hmm. you know that whole time, you know, I want time alone, you know, not being you know confined. In, it's just it was very interesting, and um, and then at the end of the day they they go their individual ways. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it was pretty insightful as far as how they, how they work and, and, and don't necessarily work together. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I've, I've discovered that too, uh, Wayne, with just about every church staff I have worked with that they don't really work as a team. Mm. They have staff meetings to come and report on what they're doing or projects they're working on, or here's something that's coming up for us, you know, plans in the future. And then, like you say, they each go to their own domain and they do their own thing. Uh, and out of their personalities, I also have observed many, many ministers who have that blue stress need uh, where they need to be off by themselves. And maybe that's good for, especially, you know, a, a preaching pastor or a teaching pastor that needs to have that alone time to go do his studies and not always be out there with the people. But um, yeah, that's, that's, that's true. I think in a lot of cases and what, what I, you know, see and some of what you have seen there, I think is looking at what Neil was talking about, those interests to say, Hey, are you being drained because you're not addressing those interests? And that's part of the reason you're getting off into that stress behavior down in that blue behavior, because you're ignoring some of these interests that you have that are so high that they really are needs in your life. Yeah. Two, two of our, two of their um, outdoor interests were in the nineties. Ooh. And, um, you know, I, I did follow up coaching with each one of them and I, I asked the one whose outdoor was 99. I said, so like your office and he's back in his cubicle with no windows. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. And um, he's all, his part of his role is building in grounds. And I said, so how, what do you do? How, tell me, you, 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 you probably feel kind of closed in back in your office area. He said, oh, I do. It just, 
it drives me crazy. But yeah, you know, our current culture is where you know if you're not at your desk, you're not working, kind of a thing. And I'm like, mm. okay. I said, so how do you, what happens? Like when you're about ready to blow your lid, what do you do? He says, I go grab, I go grab the, um, the leaf blower and I go blow off the parking lot. <laughs> you know, um, you know, there, there was probably a better way to, to have his, his, his interests need met. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right off the bat. Let's get him out of that cubicle, man. Get, oh, find him my, a, some yeah. space with windows in it or. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a perfect ex- illustration, especially the people with high outdoor scores. That's always an easy one to zero in on. Yeah. 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 Cause my, my outdoor is fairly high. Uh-huh. Uh, and so after um, a series of coaching calls or, you know, being at my desk for a while, I do have some nice window space, here. but um, you know, just, just to go outside and take a quick walk around the neighborhood is like really refreshing. Mm. And it's interesting. I go work at a coffee shop to get work done uh, because the people and the, just that I I actually get work done better at the coffee shop than I do in my office. Yeah. I know several people like that. Uh, Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, getting their, their supervisors to recognize that uh, they can be more productive there than they can in that closed in office. Yeah. Being out there meeting with people and that sort of thing. Sometimes yeah. that's hard to get other people to recognize that unique need that they have, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it really is. So anyway, that's, that's what I've done is just kind of put it up and have some observation and just let, let them start interacting around their stuff and talking about it. And then, you know, um, it, it, just, it just leads itself to more questions and, and being like Neil said, you know, just being extra curious and, and, um, and with them. Um, yeah, it was, that was, that with that group, that was a pretty fascinating thing. I was like, so like you guys meet at staff meetings, what, a couple <laughs> hours on Monday morning and then what, go, go your individual ways all week. I, help me, help me know how you guys work. Mm. They're like, yeah, that's what we do. How did you know that? <laughs> so it was, it was very, I, I think eye opening for them. What about, uh, any, any, Shannon, were you about to unmute there? Yeah, I, I was. Uh, something, something that's been helpful for me with uh, the new reports, especially uh, with the bullet statements, you know, that are under each person's report for interest. Yes. That uh, even before starting like the one-on-one coaching is to uh, take the time and jot down their bullet points on one side of a page and then hunt through other reports I have to find someone who's kind of like the, the absolute opposite for their areas of interest and put those bullet points and then just show them the piece of paper, not on the grid, but just show the bullet points and say, uh, you know, which, which set of these bullet points do you resonate most with? Which, which ones would you find more interesting? Which ones Ah. would you choose? And, and it, what they, what I've always seen is that they pick the ones that reflect themselves Uh and, and then it ends up being a good uh, conversation starter to say, well, this is, these are bullet points that come from your report. Uh, and it's not, it's not surprising that you wouldn't pick these others because they're, they're the complete opposite of what your areas of interest are. Yeah. Uh, but then challenge them to say, you know, you'll need to pay, pay attention this week because as we unpack with everyone else, one of the people in this group will have this indicators as their interest. And <laughs> it, you, you can already you need to be thinking through who is that that's so different from me and how can I be more alert to who they are and what they might, what they might enjoy doing or, or choose to do. And you can see them already start to puzzle with, wow, I haven't, I've been spending all this time thinking about myself, but, but now we've already introduced the, the concept of be alert for others as to what their areas of interest are. And it, and that's even before you even show the grid, just, just some basic bullet statements. And right. It peaks, it peaks their curiosity and it, uh, it opens the door for us to start unpacking it. And it uh, gives a sense of validity to, to the, the battery of questions they had to answer. Hey, that, that's, that's great to get them actually looking at and thinking about those opposites early on that way to say, I am this way as opposed to that opposite and thinking, and there may actually be someone who is in that opposite. Sure. 
because you know most of the time uh, people's uh, natural assumption is that everyone else is like me and guess what they really aren't <laughs> right. so that's good that's good that's good Shannon um, Wayne what did would you want to one bad more I, I would just say one other one other thing because I was reading the the the, the um, explanation of the core belief here um, one of the things I do in follow-up coaching and this is after we've spent time with the components um, but I'll typically um, on a follow-up coaching appointment ask people to um, um, bring back um, one or two curiosity events I call them a curiosity events someone else taught me this um, mm -hmm. that happened um, between our coaching calls and a curiosity event is you know some interaction typically that that person has had with someone else and um, there was a, a a response that happened either this person or the person they were either the coachee or the person they were talking to but some some kind of interaction happened between the two of them and mm -hmm. and so let's be curious about so like how did that conversation go so one person was like well I had a conversation with my boss and right in the middle of it it seems like they took offense and the conversations went down the tubes oh. So let's be curious about that. What happened in the conversation? And so then we'll start looking at their, at how they talk and how they, you know, how the a particular component might enter into that, you know, some need. A lot of times, a lot of times if my needs aren't being met, then I'll react in a conversation out of a stress behavior or something. So just um, asking people to bring back curiosity events and then really help them begin to nail down their personal interactions with people um, around around those things, and then taking and applying either the Berkman map or the components um, back into that conversation, so that they can start self coaching hmm. um, as they as they begin interacting with um, with other people. I like that curiosity events. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we're we're constantly looking for you know, the stimulation of, of good, powerful questions that we need to ask people. And as we want to be uh, naturally curious anyway in a good coaching conversation, that's a good way to, 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 to think of that, curiosity events that we're looking for. Yeah, yeah. The greatest compliment ever paid to me by in coaching was uh, a guy said, yeah, I was in a conversation with someone the other day, and it was getting tense, and I just found myself – um, asking myself my qu the question in my brain, what would Wayne ask right now? <laughs> I thought, wow, that's that's that was a huge compliment. So, yeah, you, my, my goal is just to help people be curious about themselves, be curious about the the other person, and yeah. and what might be going on with the other person, and then and then using the needs and the stress and even the interests and all uh, usual behavior. But a lot of times, a lot of those conversations comes out of the needs and stress. Yeah. Now, now, when you're looking at it with the person here, uh, and you're looking, say, at the Berkman map, that's the tool we're using to get at these uh, interests and needs or the underlying um, needs or expectations. We're, we're starting off with the map. What about when you have people with symbols that are close to the line? Or what about people that are near the, the center with their symbols? What do you do to help them to start understanding their uniqueness? <laughs> you guys can help me because my diamond is all the way down in the bottom left-hand corner of the green. Okay, so you're real close to the yellow. I'm real close to all of them. <laughs> and, oh, okay. I'm so down the bottom left-hand corner. Bottom left-hand of the green, so you're, you're, you, you've got that center effect right there, right, Wayne? Yeah, so you guys coach me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, so what kinds of questions might we be asking Wayne about his diamond that is so close to the center there? Well, let me just throw out a question here about that. Um, yeah, Mark. If, if you can ask a question like, um, in these four quadrants, where do you see yourself functioning um, equally or better um, than others? Uh, which do you, where do you see yourself and how does this, how does this uh, exhibit itself? How, do, how is this shown in your life? I think it's a great way to just uh, trigger the imagination by, by saying, um, 
do you live mostly here or do you live mostly here? Uh, where, where is that at? Describe what that's like. Mm -hmm. Good. What other questions might you have for Wayne with his diamond being so close to the center there? It's plotted in the green quadrant, but it's real close to the center. Help me, guys. Help me. <laughs> so, Wayne, what are some ways you found yourself uh, being a liaison or a, a person in between other people? Um, have you found yourself recently dealing with that? That's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. And back to Mark's question, I think the, the common denominator is um, people. And, and typically, you know, everything I – I do uh, typically revolves around helping other people move, move forward. And so you would agree that at the end of the day, when you had to make some choices, it, it tends to fall over into the green part of the people and in the direction of more direct conversation. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else anyone would want to observe or questions you would want to ask someone like that? So here's, here's what I wonder, Larry. Yeah. So for me, my asterisk is straight up. Yeah. All the way up to the top of the green, right next to the red line. So okay. one of the things Paul taught us in the training was movement is important. Yes. And direction, you know, distance and direction. That's right. Okay. So, what, how does um, my interests, which are, you know, direct with people slash task, um, how does that, and, and then how does that play in with my, with my diamond then? Would, mm -hmm. would, would that be something that, that we would want to explore? Yeah, it would. Of course, what you want to keep in mind is that interests, <clears throat> remember, tell us what it is we want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, the diamond is your learned behavior. How you have discovered is the best way for you to get that job done. So uh, interests are, in are not an indicator of behavior. They are underlying, they're unseen, just like needs or expectations are. And so because they are hidden, uh, where we want to look for is the movement from your interests to your usual style, that diamond behavior. And you say, hey, I've got some very direct kinds of things I would like to communicate to people. And, you know, with those interests that are pulling you over in the direction of the red, you've got some strong red interests that are pulling it in that direction as well. And, you know, some of your, what may be pushing it higher to the top, may be also to do with your aversions that might be down in the lower two quadrants, the yellow and the, and, and the uh, blue may be pushing those interests up even higher because of your aversions. And so we look and say, okay, you start out with these interests. Now you tend to become less direct in the way you're addressing people than some of your interests might interest, indicate that you would, would be. Uh, but you say, hey, I have learned to be kind of, you know, moderated in my approach. And the fact that it is close to the center says you can operate in all four quadrants pretty effectively. Uh, you can kind of pick and choose. Uh, which not everyone can do as well as you can do. It also means you can you know, understand where just about everybody is coming from. But one of the things we see about those central scores is that, and again, this is a generalization. When we, we get down into your components, we might see, you know, this might not be true completely, but the generalization would be that people who tend to be toward the center uh, tend to be turned off by extremes, by extreme behaviors in any of the quadrants. So they're wanting to look for moderation all around. And one of the questions that came about, uh, someone was asking just a few moments ago about finding, uh, Shannon was asking you about uh, possibly finding yourself to be a, an interpreter, a moderator, a go-between kind of person, because you can understand uh, all four worlds. Does that seem to, to, to be true for you? Yes. Wayne? Yeah. Yeah, in fact, that was that happened a lot with this last pastoral staff I was dealing with, mm -hmm. and um, um, 
trying to really them trying to understand each other better because they're although their circle square was all in the same general area everything else was very different mm -hmm. yeah it's so part of the work with this particular church staff is helping them understand each other and how each other functions and then helping them learn how to function together ah yeah so you know <clears throat> That that may come in very handy for you as a coach. Yeah. You know, being able to operate in all those different realms, all those different worlds. So um, as we're coaching people with those symbols, and, and here we zeroed in on Wayne's asterisk and his diamond, because he has one that's close to one quadrant, and then his diamond that's in the center, so he's got some aspects of all four quadrants. As we're helping people with those symbols that are close to the line, uh, helping them to understand that they're drawing some from all the different worlds, from all the different descriptions of the quadrants. And um, that that, again, zeroes right in on this core belief that we have that it is a, a perfect illustration of the uniqueness of each individual. Yes. That, Wayne, your diamond ends up being in the green, but you are not like the other guy whose diamond is way up in the extreme corner of the green. So let me ask you this, Larry. So you, I, it, it would be really hard to look at an, a person's, you know, um, uniqueness, though, without looking at all four. Oh, yes. Because, you know, even though I might have a, you know, my, my asterisk and diamond is where it is, if my circle square was somewhere else, then then there would be that would that would be a be a game changer oh yeah in fact where is your circle square um it's um um halfway up the green all the way on the right okay so all three of your symbols are in the green right mm -hmm. but right. again the the greenness of your diamond is not the same as the greenness of your circle square right right and so again, you know, we're looking for that direction of movement. Um, so smack dab in the middle of the green, pretty solidly green with that yellow, uh, I mean, with that circle square uh, need and stress, but tending to go back to the moderation of it with your usual style of behavior. And you're saying that even your needs and your stress are, um, a little less direct, at least a little less direct than your interests would indicate if we only looked at your interests. Right. So like I have two people that I'm coaching and mm -hmm. their, their, their asterisk and diamond are like scary close to each other, yes. but so their circle, their circle square mm -hmm. is in, is in different quadrants. Oh, okay. Yeah. So how do you coach that person? Well, it, to help them see their uniqueness, they function very similar, but their needs, and stress behaviors are very yeah. different. Right. So that, that would be a lot of uniqueness. Yeah. And I think that was confusing for them. Mm -hmm. because they do function so much alike um, in their interests and, and usual behaviors, but their, their, their needs and stress scores were way different. Yeah. Um, so it's like, okay, so let's, let's talk about how you're unique, how you're different there, and how can – how can that complement, you know, and work and how can you work and, and, and be with each other in those different areas? Yeah. And, you know, when we get people out on the map doing, say, the floor exercise with the map, right. and we see like two people whose diamonds are just right on top of each other. And they say, oh, we're just alike, aren't we? We like to get the job done just alike. But, oh, the motivations for that could be totally, completely different. Oh, yeah. And the stress behavior could be totally, completely different. And you say, well, guess what? We're not really totally, completely twins after all, are we? <laughs> you know, we're not carbon copies of each other. And uh, getting some really good discussion going on with a team that way as they're celebrating their uniqueness can be really, really fun. Well, Wayne, thank you so much for, for being our, um, I guess I could say guinea pig. I'm always reluctant to call it guinea pigs because I lived in South America where guinea pig was a delicacy and people ate those things. Hey, I appreciate the coaching and, and Shannon and Mark. Great <laughs> observation. Um, yeah. Great question, Shannon. That was, a, that was a really good question. I, good I really question. 
Yeah. Thank you. So you got a free one here, Wayne. I know. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's let's talk about the next core belief we have, which is that God uniquely designed each of us to pursue our God-given interests, passions, and goals in joy and fulfillment as a gift from Him. And as we pursue our own interests, we should also help others to pursue their interests. And that's based on Philippians 2, 4. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And as we're trying to build unity in the body of Christ with this, we look at um, our grip number three is, is where we get this, talking about areas of interest. And we have the descriptions of the 10 different interests that we measure in the Bertman method. And as we get them talking about their unique order and combination of the 10 interests, uh, get them started talking about that. And we get to see the lights really uh, getting brighter in their eyes as they talk about some of those interests. What are some of the ways that you get people to talk about this part of their being uniquely designed? How do you get people thinking about their unique interests in a way when I mean, we may have already talked some about this as we were talking about looking at the map, um, but more specifically uh, looking at uh, those uh, passions and joys. We talk about pursuing your passion. We talk about fruitfulness. Uh, talk about that sense of fulfillment. How do you get people talking about that as you're wanting them to celebrate their uniqueness? I thought Neil's illustration of the guy he was coaching yesterday was great. I mean, maybe, maybe Neil could talk more about that. Yeah, Neil, you, you really kind of zeroed in on that fellow's interests as a, as a key thing for him, didn't you? Yeah, well, yeah, because he had such a high outdoor interest, but his uh, work was uh, so office oriented, which, um, you know, I, I don't think that's that unusual, really. Right. Um, he, uh, uh, one of the things he's enjoying now as a self-employed person is he uh, he meets people in a lot of different places. So he's driving around, he's meeting you know in a coffee place, he's meeting at other people's offices, and I think that's probably going to be more a part of his future than uh, than his previous occupation. Uh, in terms of joys, uh, one of the things that uh, we have been talking about is he, well, his wife is self-employed also, and one of the things we've talked about is how uh, together they can pursue some things, uh, let's say, outside of their work that allows them uh, both to experience their their interests and their joys. And I think that's maybe that's another part of, of coaching ministry leaders is is to, uh, uh, in a sense, we're giving them permission, we're expanding their categories of, of where they can experience um, God's uh, joy and, and we're actually in the process of helping to build up their marriages their, and uh, even their, uh, their intimacy with God. And that just has all kinds of great benefits for their, uh, their ministries. Yeah. Well, speaking of couples, Neil, um, I was coaching a couple recently who had very different interests. I mean, they were pretty much opposites in their interests. He liked outdoors, fishing, technical things, very red kinds of interests. She had very blue interests, the opposite quadrant, you know, on the map, uh, literary, artistic, music. Those were her interests, and they were all very high. And so I'm talking to them about, so what do you guys do together? You know, what, what brought you together in the first place? How, how do you reconcile that? He likes to go fishing. She likes to read. Um, so they said, well, one thing that they do is they go fishing together, but she never touches a fishing pole. She just has a nice, comfortable seat in the boat, and she sits back and reads while he's fishing. Uh, so they go together and do that. And um, 
you know, he'll, he, can, he can be making new fishing lures, getting ready for his next fishing trip while they're sitting in the living room and she's enjoying reading her book or listening to her music while he's working on his fishing lures. And they found some ways that they can both pursue their interests and be together without having to necessarily uh, do the things that the other person is doing while they're pursuing their own interests and passions. Have any of you ever uh, come, you know, found anything like that, any, any way to help people find some unique ways to, to pursue those interests? Larry, we had a team build a few months ago with a group of 15 people. Mm. And, uh, their areas of interest were, were very diverse. You know, they're, they're, the majority of them uh, fell into the green quadrant, but uh, the others equally distributed between the other three. And we, we did an exercise and put them in their own quadrants with people like themselves and said, you know, if you were going to plan a outing or a fellowship or a fun day for this team, what, what would you create? What would, what would be something that would be enjoyable? And, uh, and then, you know, come back and everybody give a report, you know, from each, each different quadrant. And uh, the question came back was, if you look back on the last four years of working together, what have we done for fellowship time? What have we mm. done to play to relax? And have we actually been tipping it towards one quadrant versus in, in spite of the other three? And there was this Ooh. really big aha moment that started taking place when they were realizing, you know, we've, we've tipped it to the team leader and his wife. What they thought was fun is what we've been doing. <laughs> it, was a, it, was a, it was a good eye opener to realize not, not everybody thinks it's fun to go paintballing. <laughs> but you've been asking them to do that, but what else would be fun? And uh, so, I, so I set them down and said, well, what I'd like for you to do is plan your next four fellowships when you guys don't meet for strategy planning or engagement or anything, but just for fun and, and go ahead and calendar those events and put them in. Now this may not be fun to you, but realize it's fun to someone else. So, you know, go into it with a good attitude. And uh, it was interesting to see them negotiate what it would look like for their next four fun events. Wow. And, and somebody always stopping them and saying, wait, wait, that, that's that's becoming too green again. Stop it. We need to we need to remember we have some yellows, and uh, but it was a it was a good eye opener and a, a practical application that they could follow up on in the next in the next four quarters. Oh, that's great. Yeah, you know, um, it it's not uncommon for people to think that everyone else likes the same fun things that they like, and if that were true, then every Every triple A ball game, baseball game, here in Montgomery, where I am, we have a team called the Biscuits. And that triple A team, you know, ought to fill out the stadium if everybody had the same interest of loving baseball, regardless of what level it's at. And of course we don't. So uh, it's good for us to keep in mind that other people have different interests. And wow, Shannon, what you're doing there uh, with that team, getting them to recognize each other's interests and actually do some things that will help to help the other people to pursue their interests, which might be different. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's great. You know, and related to that, uh, we, we've talked some about this already, so I'm not going to believe it too much, but we do need to help people to give themselves permission to do what energizes them and to not do what drains them, uh, recognizing that if it's good for you, it's good for your ministry because that does build you up. And, you know, that's relating to our 65-35 principle that we talk a lot about, helping people to learn how to spend at least 65% of their time and their gifts in ministry. Let that be their goal to get to that so that they can pursue their ministry burden and their passions. And, you know, there are those things that we have to do so that 35% of our time that would be spent in other responsibilities helping them to figure out how to do that. Um, any of you have any other great insights for us in terms of how we make this particular core response, this core belief uh, work for individuals? And giving people permission to do what energizes them. Any other keys to that, Shannon? The one you gave us there was a perfect illustration, I think, of that. Um, Larry, just a just a word about that. Um, 
I've been coaching a church staff and I've done a stra- strategic plan with them and, and coaching. And they took up a, a lady who was um, very administrative, but also greatly, I think, lady, leadership gifting and skills. And they made her like executive pastor. Mm. Um, but um, her, her area, her weakness was really just managing people. And, and we worked for the first four or five months, well, end of last year, first of this year, on really helping the pastor, the lead pastor and her really renegotiate their roles with each other because mm. he has real strengths in that. But he was trying to give it away and she wasn't doing it and it was creating conflict. And so, um, you know, it has been so interesting now to see them working for the last three months in their giftedness and, you know, in, in the areas that energize them and be willing to give up the other, other areas. So that this is just absolutely huge and being able to really help people focus on that. Um, so just a testimony about how important it is. Um, and, and to know that, you know, one of the things that, especially as working with pastors, solo pastors is Mm -hmm. the idea of role renegotiation that, you know, you don't just all of a sudden quit doing the, the, the 35%. (laughs) You have to renegotiate those things. And, and if you don't, then probably after a short period of time, we'll, we'll identify you as fired. Uh, (laughs) So, you know, the idea of role renegotiation as you move from that, you know, from, you know, moving towards that 65, 35% principle, how important it is to negotiate that shift with other people that affects, whether it's your spouse or whether it's your, in your, in your, in your workplace, it's, it's really, really important to, to negotiate that and and work through it over a period of time. Well, that's interesting, Wayne. Uh, Yeah. And as I get to thinking about it, it's probably that 35% that gets more people fired than pursuing their 65%, isn't it? Yeah, they want to give up that. They want to give up that thirty-five. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's like, well, I, I just want to do what I'm passionate about. And you know, um, um, you know, even the president of the United States is the most powerful person in the world. Has things that he has to do by law. He can't. He can't not do them. Right. Typically. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, so there's always, you know, I call it the, the spiritual gift of pick up the end of the dang table and carry it. All of us have stuff like that. We just have to do it. Mm. And sooner or later, everybody has to pick up the end of the table and move it. So what does your table look like? You've got to move. Yeah, and, exactly. Yeah. But to negotiate that and, you know, this, this particular lady, she was probably spending 65% of her time in the areas that she wasn't strong in. Um, and so we had to negotiate and renegotiate that role for her. And now the pastor is actually functioning much better in his giftedness as well as, as she is. And, um, and they're working together on things. Um, whereas before there was a lot of tension and a kind of coming at each other and conflict and stuff constantly going on, but it, but it took time to renegotiate that and and to get there. How did you help them to articulate what those, ministry burdens and passions were? Um, well, it was going back and looking at the interests. Mm-hmm. Um, they um, looked at their, um, the um, career pieces, because that gives some insight into my areas of interest and things mm-hmm. as well. And, um, and then um, we, we spent some time looking at usual style. So we did several individual as well as um, joint coaching sessions with them. And, um, um, and then they did a lot of work in between. Um, and I'd like to say it was really smooth, but it was, it was a struggle for them. Mm. And, um, um, but, but they got there and I just did a coaching call with them yesterday over a a personnel issue and some stuff and to, to hear them working together on this thing from their strengths and each of them from their strengths was just really encouraging for me. Wow. Um, so, you know, they got there, but it, it, it took some time to get there. And are they at the, at the point now, Wayne, where they can celebrate each other's strengths and, and, and yes. uh, interests? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they, they really see it. And they, yesterday in that coaching appointment, there was, there, I, I could see the give and take, uh-huh. you know, 
One would say, well, you know, I, I kind of observe this and see this. What do you think? Not talking to me, but to the other person. Good. And so it was, um, yeah, I, yeah, I agree with you. I think that's, you see that better than I do, um, was one comment. So it was like, it was really cool to see that. Because wow. the previous, well, it was, it's been going well for about two or three months now. But the previous six months before that was huge conflict between wow. And you have a pastor and an executive pastor in conflict. <laughs> that is, that is the disaster, you know, that's the menu for re recipe for disaster. Yes. You know? Yeah. Because so, if anybody needs to be talking in unity, those two need to. Yeah. Yeah. And, and now it just seems like the whole staff, I mean, they're together on stuff and they've gotten the whole staff aligned together around and they're, they're moving. It, it, I haven't seen a move like this in three years. So oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So that's, that was really important, but the whole idea of not doing it in a vacuum. Yeah. Well, Wayne, you've given us another perfect illustration that, that segues us to this last core belief I wanted us to look at today. And just briefly, we can talk about this because we may have already touched on it pretty much. Uh, the more we can understand about our own God given strengths and needs, the better we can also understand the strengths and needs of others. And then we can work, uh, we can better work together building the body of Christ. So from Colossians 3.17, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then from 1 Peter 4.10, as each has received a gift, use it to serve another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So to kind of maybe let this be our wrap up uh, core belief for today, uh, Wayne, you've given us an example of how people began to understand, first of all, their own strengths and needs, and then could start to understand the strengths and needs of others. And then that helped them to begin to learn how to work better to build up the body. I think you gave us a perfect example of that there. Anyone else have uh, any other comment about this particular core belief and uh, maybe even relating back to Wayne's illustration, or perhaps another illustration that you'd like to share about um, how you've used this. In particular, now we are using the insights reports and the career exploration report to address this particular core belief. Neil, I think I see your mics open. Oh, right. I, uh, I was just, as Wayne was talking, I was thinking about the uh, grid that we put up uh, last week in Calgary uh, with the, the strengths across the top. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the two two rows, one uh, uh, indicating uh, what, what was it? well, it was all of the, it was the interest across the top, and then uh, people put in their scores uh, for the top two and the bottom two, and it, it gave a, a very graphical uh, representation of the team and uh, where interests are. And yes, others haven't been exposed to that exercise. I think it's a really good one. And, uh, and it helps to, to get at this question. Yeah, that, uh, that illustration, in fact, we did, we, we did a kind of a variation on that one at the celebration and we adjusted it somewhat this time. Uh, we were fortunate to have a big enough whiteboard that we could just write all 10 uh, interests across the top there, but you could do this even with you know, flip chart paper or anything, even if you had to put it on two different boards. But um, having it all together there close by was, was helpful where you can, have the list of the 10, and then have everyone on a sticky note write their top two uh, with, it, with those scores and their bottom two with those scores. So we can also see what their aversions are. And when you get those up on the board and you see where the strengths of the team are with their interests and where the aversions tend to be and where do we have big gaps there that we might need to address, and that was a good team exercise to get people started thinking in terms of, oh, we do have a wide spread of interests. And if we were going to have uh, this team doing, Shannon, the kind of exercise that you were doing with the team you were talking about, uh, how might we address this wide spread? We had a group of what, I think it was 11 people, Neil, that were up on the board with that one. And um, how would we address this wide spread of interests that way in, in this group to help them all take advantage of their strengths? I think it was a very effective way to uh, help a, a large group of people see where the, the diversity is and, and also where the common ground is. 
Yeah. So, uh, I, I plan to use that uh, more often. And uh, uh, I also thought that your point about, uh, you know, even if we do have missing uh, spaces here, uh, this is the team God's given us. And <laughs> this, is, this is what we have to work with, and this is what we're asking God to empower. So uh, let's be the best lopsided group of people we can be. And uh, just trust God with the uh, you know, with the outcomes. Yeah. Have any of you uh, used the strengths report, the the uh, insights reports, uh, or even the uh, career exploration report to help get at this particular core belief? In fact, that's that is the get a grip that it uh, comes with. That's under get a grip number four in our training manual now. Yeah, Shannon. Yeah. yeah, we. I actually had the team look at uh, their career exploration and uh, had them go ahead and write down uh, the ones where they pretty well nearly maxed out or maxed out the chart. And uh, and then we discuss, you know, where do you see the traits that fall into this quadrant as uh, something that contributes to this team's mission? Mm. Uh, for example, uh, one other person had a really strong thing in legal. And, but they're not an attorney, but, but they're, really, they're really strict on rules. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so they're really, really strong on making sure there's a, the right way to do things in the rules. And, and so, you know, so we've talked about that. How does, how does someone who understands the rules help this team? Uh, and, and two or three people said, well, we, you know, for example, how to use different budget items. What's the proper way? What's the right way? What are the parameters, et cetera? Well, could you, you know, and it was her name was Susie, said, Susie, can you – can you just kind of make a note that that's what the team needs from you? And, uh, and it was interesting to kind of go around because none of us, you know, very few of us, when you look at the different careers, that's not the vocation we have, but we have some tendencies or some leanings toward those types of things. But then trying to draw that parallel between how does that play itself out in this team, even though that's not your specialty. Yeah. Uh, it made for a good point of conversation. Uh, we couldn't take it too extreme because – we, we, you know, we just, we couldn't talk about protective services or you know, <laughs> installation maintenance or whatever that was, you know, we just didn't do that very well, but, but at least it, cre it created a way to, to look at that and, and pull out what other people might add that we've been overlooking. Yeah. Good, good, good. I want to encourage you to um, Experiment more with those insight reports. Our Grit Berkman package has the one strengths report that is in there. Then we also provide those four extra reports, managing conflict, biggest mistakes you can make with me, relationship disruptors, and um, uh, did I mention managing time? That's the fourth one. Uh, those are four things that everybody has to deal with and uh, the group of uh, Grit Bertman trainers got together and went through all of those reports and came up with these four as the four bonus reports we thought would be most beneficial. We didn't want to overload people. We thought four was about the limit. But those, those reports are easy to work with. They have simple language. You don't have to learn Bertmanese of any kind. You don't have to define any terms to be able to use those simple statements and get people started reflecting. You can use them in your one-on-one -on -one coaching with folks to say, hey, talk to me about these statements that you see here and which ones stand out most to you. Uh, and you can get them talking to each other with those. Uh, Shannon, your exercise of pulling those statements that uh, from perhaps someone else's report and saying, hey, here are some opposite statements. Throw that in with them and say, how do you react to those and how might you interact with other people? Uh, we use them many times to get two people talking together, reading each other's reports and talking about what's important to them. And uh, as a good um, icebreaker, we use them many times as the first way to get a team to introduce each other uh, from uh, usually using their strengths report. We don't like to start off with that biggest mistakes report, but using the strengths report and the biggest mistakes reports together can make for a pretty good um, session of dialogue, both for uh, just two individuals talking together or uh, getting a team to mix it up with using those statements as well. So I want to uh, encourage you 
to use those strengths reports in creative ways uh, and share back with us how you're doing that. You can share with us by uh, writing uh, any of us on the leadership team, write to support at gripbrookman.com and share those. And uh, Ken DeMar is with us on the call today. And Ken, I know um, you and Jay would love to get those. Jay would love to get those particularly and include some of those in the newsletter uh, with other people. Uh, that we're sharing uh, those those uh, illustrations that you might have of ways that you're using some of these reports in more creative ways. Anyone else have uh, anything else you'd like to add particularly about uh, this particular core belief that we've been talking about? Well, since our time is really and truly up, uh, I want to thank you for the good dialogue. Wayne, thank you for being our volunteer today and letting us zero in on your report. Thanks for the free coaching. coaching. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. any of the rest of you can get the same free coaching anytime when you see an illustration from your own report that you'd like to use. That'll be great. Uh, let me just remind you that we do have some events coming up. Uh, our celebration will be in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, we're we're going to be... Uh, Arriving there uh, in October, you'll see details about that in the newsletter. Be sure and mark that on your calendar uh, around October the uh, 22nd, I believe, is the day that we actually believe, and we'll be there uh, starting on uh, uh, the 22nd and going through the 24th or so. Then um, uh, also, for those of you that have not been to Signature Training, if you're interested in going to that next level of training, Signature Training is also going to be in the Dallas-Fort Worth area in August, August the 20th through the 22nd. Uh, registration on that will be open through about August the 1st or so. If you want more information about that, you can write to me at LarryNGay at uh, gmail.com, or you can uh, send your request to support at gritbertman.com, and they'll pass it on to me, and we'll get that information to you. So it's been great being with you folks. Thanks for all the participation. We look forward to seeing you next month again. Uh, and remember, our whole purpose of this is to try and help build unity in the body of Christ so more people will come to know Jesus. Keep that at the forefront, folks, always, that the reason we're trying to help teams be better is ultimately so we'll see more fruit coming to the kingdom. The Lord bless you all, and we'll see you next month. Bye-bye.